like we had one kid that had no fever whatsoever. So it's it's just random some of the stuff they're getting to the test the positive. Well, I don't know what to do with that. Christmas, she's doing a study abroad thing. She's going to Mexico for two weeks. She's kind of excited about that. My, ever since I did a security update, if I turn it sideways, it won't turn sideways. It won't like fill the screen. Ever since I did that last update on Amazon or um, iPhone, I can't ever tell if things are right or not. I hold it up, it's right. Weird. Weird. I did the last one. My phone like said it won't let me tilt anymore. I don't know what it is. Check if there's another one out there.
some bug thing where I can't see the full view. I'm not sure what it is. It looks fine on my screen, but I can't see anything. So if there's something going on, you can't see the picture clearly, just send a message on there so I can correct it, because uh, I can't see it myself. Uh, but we'll check that out. Don't get that going. I'll get on my computer in a minute to see if it looks better there. Uh, but if you're online, we're glad you're there. Uh, but again, let me know if there's a problem with what you see. Uh, tonight is our church picnic, our annual church picnic. I hope you'll come out and join us for that. Uh, that is at 5 o'clock tonight. If you're one of the deacons and you're part of that process, they would like you here around 3.30 today. Uh, that's the message I've been given. Uh, so around 3.30 today to help set up and get prepared for this evening. And then if you're coming, which hopefully you are, uh, we can just ask that you bring side dishes and desserts. They're going to have the hamburgers and hot dogs and all the fixings for that, buns and all that good stuff. Uh, but just bring some side dishes, bring your cornhole boards, any lawn chairs, anything you want to do. We'll have the food set up out in the narthex area, then we'll have some tables outside, some tables in the narthex area. Uh, so uh, we'll be over on this side of the building for that this evening. Hope you'll come out and join us. If you're online, come on down. We'd love to have you as well. If you've only been joining us online recently, uh, we'd love to have you for our picnic as well. Again, that's tonight at 5 o'clock. We are glad you're here this morning. Let's worship together. Praise Him, to remember all that He has done for us, and remember who He is. To stand as we worship and praise His name.
grateful to be in this place. And believers that we can stand and sing in spite of all that's going on right now. Personally, collectively, culturally, whatever's going on. We can stand and sing and declare that you are the Lord of all. So God, we praise you for your sovereignty. We praise you for your goodness. We praise you for mercy that's never ceasing. We praise you for grace that is unending and undeserving. As we sing our come to a prayer, Lord. We are sealed. words from your words. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. We sing those words knowing that that's the Lord. We're kept by the Lord. He's here. Amen. And yet, as we can sing this beautiful words.
find your Bibles, join me in James chapter 1. We're going to be working through verse 8 this morning, starting with verse 2. But welcome back to the book of James. And I want to make sure and take a moment to thank Lee for covering for me last week for preaching. And I know he's always faithful. Um, even the Sunday that I had to leave spur of the moment, he, uh, he amazes me how he can shoot from the hip and uh, do what's needed on a spur of the moment. So thank you, Lee, for taking care of things. We saw two weeks ago that James, the half-brother of Jesus, was the author of this book. You remember there were five Jameses listed in the New Testament? We kind of worked through each of those and kind of narrowed it down to where it's obviously James, the half-brother of Jesus, and saying that he's the half-brother because uh, Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit, Mary was a virgin, and that his brothers and his sisters were born of earthly origin from uh, Joseph. And so uh, James was not only the half-brother of Jesus, he was the pastor of the Jerusalem church, uh, and his writing style was more straightforward and practical. And his theme was faith that works. A lot of folks tended to, tend to focus too much on the works that are part of the faith. But faith produces <coughs> works in our lives because we believe in God. And because we believe in God, we act on that. And that's where the works come from. And then he wrote to the dispersed Jewish believers around 44 to 45 A.D. And remember, that was only about 14 or 15 years after the resurrection of Jesus. So these were early believers, and they were dispersed as a result of Saul's persecution that took place there in Jerusalem. And that scattered the believers. You remember in Acts 1.8, Jesus said, You will be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the uttermost, uttermost parts of the earth. The carrying out of that came as a result of the persecution that drove the believers out of Jerusalem. And so uh, that's how this came about. Now, if you look at Paul and James, you look at these two authors in the New Testament, uh, Paul wrote 23.8% of the New Testament writings. Pretty much one-fourth of everything you read in the New Testament comes from Paul's writing hand based on his missionary journeys, three different journeys that he carried out, and he's, he's writing to follow up on those. James, however, comprises 1.26% of the New Testament, so he didn't write a whole lot of the New Testament compared to what Paul wrote. But when you compare their writing styles and you look at, just say, for instance, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, you look at three of Paul's books, most of what he wrote, uh, not most of, but much of what he wrote was in introductory comments, greetings. And his greetings were rather lengthy. He wrote personal references to people and believers there. He, he wrote prayers for them and with them to help encourage them. And so he had lengthy introductions. But you come to James's writings, and all of his introduction, all of his greeting is con contained in verse 1, 20 words. And then he immediately cuts to the chase. He immediately gets to what he's writing about. He did, it, there's not a whole lot of beating around the bush. He gets right to it. I like that. Uh, he also displayed an amazing humility uh, in introducing himself as a slave to his half-brother, Jesus Christ the Lord. He referred to his brother, half-brother, as the Lord. And that's, that's amazing, but that shows his humility. In that he, and that, that, that radiates through his entire writings. He deals a lot, and we saw this kind of in looking at introduction, he deals a lot with commands, but his commands are not domineering. He doesn't write and say, if you don't do this, you don't belong. But he writes and, set, and, he, and he gives, out of uh, 108 verses, he gives 54 commands 
That's roughly 20% of his writings that he gives to not just the believers then, but to us as well. Now, if you look around in our day, there are a whole lot of folks that like how-to series. You, you, can, you can go on YouTube and you can pretty much find out how to do anything. A lot of stuff that you probably don't want to know how to do, but you can learn how on YouTube videos. Uh, and then if you can't find them there, you can go to DIY information on TV. DIY means do it yourself. And so you can learn how to do much, pretty much anything on YouTube, on DIY TV, and those types of things. But here's the deal about James's writings. Uh, James gets to the point, and he deals with how to do it. In fact, Many people believe that James's writings are the how to do it manual for the Christian life. I like that, the how to do it manual. Too often the church uh, has mastered the art of, um, of informing people regarding what they should be doing and not telling them how to do it. But James does tell how to do it. In fact, uh, most of his uh, writings are as relevant today as they were 2,000 years ago when he wrote this book. He tells us things like how to profit from trials. We'll see that this morning. How to obtain wisdom. That'll be our closing point this morning. How to overcome temptation. How to communicate. And to communicate without sounding like you're dealing in wrath and being harsh with other believers. A whole lot of how-tos. I like that. So let's roll up our sleeves and let's jump right in with James. And we're going to begin reading here in verse 2, where James writes, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. If any of you lack, bless you. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith, without, with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is double-minded, he is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Now just so, just to make sure and emphasize, if you didn't see it in the opening screen, we're reading in the New King James Version. So if you're reading NIV, there'll be a little difference in the, uh, in the wording and that type of thing. But the first thing James deals with is faith that's tested. Faith that's tested. And you have to understand that uh, you have, or you have to know that faith that's worth having is always tested. Faith that's worth having is always tested. And that testing works for us, not against us. It works for us. Now, just as far as making sure we understand where we're coming from, James' first two words show the heart of this Jerusalem pastor when he calls them my brethren or my brothers. It's more than just a, uh, uh, a polite or routine gesture. It's expressing his love for these believers that used to be a part of the church there in Jerusalem. And obviously he had built a very close relationship with them. And just because they were scattered from there, he didn't say, well, easy come, easy go. Make it, make it the best you can wherever you end up. He didn't do that. That's what this writing is all about. He's writing to them saying, don't lose your faith. Stay true to form. Stay true to the same Jesus that you put your faith in when you were in the church here in Jerusalem. So he's writing to them to encourage them to stay true. And uh, so there is this passion for these believers. Now, interestingly, James' opening words in verse 2 are a command, even though it doesn't sound much like a command. But he says, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Now, to count it means to reckon it or to consider it a joy. Now, this is the amazing part. He, ca he calls for them and for us 
to consider it joyful to be put in a trial. That trial in and of itself is not pleasurable. I don't know of anyone in this room that would say, I went through a trial last week. It was the most enjoyable thing. It was like a roller coaster ride, and I just, I just loved it. I don't know of anybody that would say that about a trial. We can't rejoice in it because it's pleasurable, but we can because it's purposeful. There is a purpose to it. And the purpose is we rarely ever understand the purpose until the trial is finished and we can look back and say that's what God was up to. You can't see it in the midst of it. The clouds are too thick. The rain is too heavy. It's too hard to see what he's up to in the midst of it. But when you look back you say, you can say what a faithful God. He never left me. He never forsook me. He was always there with me through the whole course of the journey. Now, every Christian encounters difficulties in life. Every, every one of us do. And repeatedly, the question comes up, why did this happen to me? Have you ever asked that? Why did this happen to me? What did I do to incur this punishment? What did I do wrong? And we're always looking at the trials as though God is taking taking out his wrath on us. Now, when you think of a trial and you think of somebody who went through difficulties, who's usually the first person we think of biblically? Job. Job. There's a whole book written on him. And it's amazing because Satan comes, there was a day, that says, now, there was a day when Satan came before God, and that's kind of scary to think that Satan could come before God, but he did. And he accused God of protecting Job and protecting Job's family. That was his accusation. And he actually told God, he said, you watch. He'll curse you if you remove your hands and you let me have my way with him. Just turn me loose for a little while. I'll wreak havoc in his life and he'll curse your name. So that was the accusation. Here's what happened. One servant or one messenger after another came to Job. One after another. A total of four consecutive messengers came to Job and said, This happened. That happened. Culminating with the last of those when they were in the older brother's house. And a wind came and it knocked the house down and it killed all of his sons and daughters. All of his sons and daughters. Within a matter of just a few moments... Job lost everything. Everything. You remember, Satan said, he'll curse you. You wait and see. What did Job do? Listen to what he said. Then Job arose. He tore his robe. He shaved his head. I like that. He shaved his head. He fell to the ground and he worshipped. This is what he said. Naked I came into the world. And naked I will leave. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job did not sin, nor charge God with wrong. In all of this. Now, you, that's early in like the second chapter. And you go through the whole book. And this happens, and that's ha that happens. And you get these three friends, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar, that come and they... They tell him to do this and do that. Then his wife, Job's wife, even comes and says, curse God and die. And all this happens. And the second time Satan comes and he gives him boils from, his, from his, the toes of his feet to the top of his head. And, and he's tortured physically. And all this happens. And the only thing you really get from Job, he curses the day he was born. He basically says, if I just died when I was born, all of this wouldn't happen. At no point does he turn against God. In Job 42.10, basically says, when Job prayed for his friends, the same three that wreaked havoc on him, Eliph El Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar, when he prayed for them, that point, 
God blessed him, gave him twice as much as he had before. He was doubly blessed because he praised God in the midst of all of that. Got restored. It's amazing that suffering can be a source of blessing. Difficulties, trials, tests can be a result. There's no futility in it. God doesn't waste the difficulty. He's up to something good. Now, here's the weird part. When's the last time difficulty came on you and your first thought was, God's up to something good? <laughs> That's usually the last thing we think. We usually think, okay, what did I do? I crossed the line somewhere. But God is up to something. Good. I, I want to encourage you. Next time difficulties come, you just, just say, God, what are you up to? You put a smile on your face and wait and see the blessing that comes on you. Maybe not immediately, but he's always up to something good. That's why I say that testing is working for you, not against you. God's up to something good. And that means that when our trial, when our faith is tested, that testing will produce patience. Patience. I was talking with Bonnie and Dean over here earlier, and I made the comment, I'm not a real patient patient. <laughs> when it comes to going through difficulties, I'm just kind of looking at my watch saying, okay, are we there yet? Uh <laughs> We were talking about when we'd go on vacation trips. My first, before we even got out of the driveway, I'd ask my dad, are we there yet? Are we there yet? And I do the same thing with difficulty so many times because I'm not real patient. But you see, patience doesn't come like that. It's not the first thing you get. It's usually the last thing that comes as a result of the trials and the difficulties. And it, here's the deal. When you call them tests, I always hated tests when I was in school. I always felt like somebody was out there that was up to something no good. And this was their tool of torture for me, a test. I just never did like tests. But according to James, I can rejoice knowing that the testing is going to produce patience. In the days before Jesus came, people believed that trials were simply to be endured. They didn't think there was any rejoicing that could come through it. But the rejoicing is a result of understanding that God is up to something. There is a purpose in it. One of the benefits of having worked in an assembly line, I, I didn't work long in an assembly line. Deb will remember Richard Glenn. But when I was in college, before we ever met, Richard and his dad had a, uh, had a small business, not massive output, but they, they would cut and <coughs> shrink wrap plaques and send them all over the state when people were doing this, that, and the other, and not just plaques, but uh, shelving and uh, that type of thing. And they did that, and they, they shipped it all over the state of Alabama. People would call in and place orders, and. They would do this. They had the capacity to cut, cut the plaques in different shapes and sizes and all that kind of stuff. And I worked there. And I didn't have a major task. I just knew that there was somebody that was in charge that knew what he was doing. And I was simply to do my job and trust the results <coughs> to the boss. The same is true in life. God's in and when we understand that there's a purpose for the process and we put our faith in him, that's when patience comes. Because we, we hang on for the long haul. I'm not just here for the moment. I'm not just here to get a paycheck and walk away and get something good to eat. I'm here for the long haul. And patience is often... Described as being long-suffering, as being steadfastness. What that means is hanging on till you get where you're going. Where are we going? 
we're going wherever God is leading us. And it's trusting the journey to him and just trusting the process to him and waiting for him to get us where we're going. That's patience. It comes in the process. Think of it this way. Faith is like a muscle. And uh, Janet will understand this. I'm not going to use this arm because that's the Popeye muscle. I'll use this arm. Uh, but faith is like a muscle. The more you exercise it, the stronger it gets. Now, the muscle that we're talking about is not made for sprinting. It's made for the long haul. It's made for a marathon race. And it's something, it's like cross country. It's something that you don't go through it quickly. If you start out fast, you, <laughs> you may not finish. But if you understand the process and you trust the process to God, that muscle that's developed will get you there, but you've got to wait on Him in the journey. That's when patience comes. So, faith that's tested. Faith, faith worth having is always tested. The second thing James deals with is a patience that's permitted. Patience that's permitted. James said, let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Now here's the deal. To let means, to let is to surrender, to surrender. Sixteen times in the book of James, 108 verses, that's the total verses that James writes, 16 times in those 108 verses, he uses the word let seven times. Seven times. Uh, actually, 17 times. In the first chapter, uh, seven times in the first chapter alone, four times in the seven verses we're looking at today in our text. Four times. The first of those we just saw. Let, uh, let patience have its perfect work. That's the first of those lets. This, now here's the key. I mentioned that he had 54 commands. 20% of James' writings... 54 commands means uh, that they're in the Greek imperative tense, meaning it's, it's a mandatory. If you really want to get through this and get through it right, then you need to do this. That's the mandatory aspect. So to let patience have its perfect work means to surrender the process to him. To simply step back and say, God, I'm not going to try to tweak it. I'm not going to stick this in there. I'm not going to figure, try to figure it out. I'm going to surrender it to you and wait on you to accomplish your will in your way in your time. That's surrendering the process to him. And according to James, when we do that, we come out at the end lacking nothing. Now, doesn't that sound like a good end result? You don't want to come out saying, well, <laughs> I came up short at the end. Uh, I came up with an empty bag. We lack nothing when we surrender the process to him. And the key here is that God only works in those who let him. I like that. God is a gentleman. He doesn't barge into your life or into mine and say, Step back and let me do what I want to do. He doesn't do it that way. He waits for us to surrender to him. He waits for us to open the door and let him have his way in our lives. That's how God deals with us. And I love that, that he doesn't barge in. Now, when my kids were still kids, now we got grandkids, but when my kids were still kids, I still remember many times they came home, they always brought the forms to mom. I don't know why. But they always brought these permission forms. Y'all remember permission forms. And what they were doing, there was some kind of outing or some kind of field trip that they were getting permission to go on. But they usually had to send, we usually had to send money back to help pay for the trip and that type of thing. But under, you have, I had to understand.
understand early on that my kids couldn't go on that trip unless we signed the form and gave permission. God deals with us in the same way, except he doesn't send forms. <laughs> I hope you didn't get a form in the mail from God saying, I need your permission. It doesn't happen that way. Permission is when we surrender it to him. What that means is opening the door and saying, God, it's not about me. It's all about you. I like that. It's all about you. And I'm letting you have your way in my life in and through this process. That's surrendering to God. And that's when we let him do what he wants to do. And when that happens, it's all good. The process may not feel that good, but you understand the goodness of God. I love the song, Good, Good Father. When we're in the midst of those difficulties, you can trust your good, good Father. When you open the door, God does what only God can do. The third thing James deals with is wisdom that's requested. Wisdom. James said, if any of you lacks wisdom, here's the second of those four lets, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. Now, you see the next point, there's a blank. The blank of prayer, the, or the blank with prayer. The problem with prayer is this. Most of us would say there's no problem with prayer. Well, here's the problem with prayer. James said in verse 5 that the problem is not a matter of what's lacking. The problem shows up with his command, let him ask of God. We'll get to this in a few, well, probably a couple of months. But James chapter 4, verse 2 Says James says that you do not have because you do not ask. That's the problem with prayer. So many times we don't get what we're waiting on because we don't ask. And to ask is in the continuous imperative sense, meaning that you can't ask once and say, well, I asked for it and I didn't get it. You ask until God says no, or he does what you're asking. It's continuous imperative. Now, Wednesday night, we're going to be, I'll be doing the Bible study. And the Bible study this Wednesday night is out of Matthew 7. Many of you will remember Matthew 7, 7. There are three imperatives there. Ask, seek, and knock. Jesus said, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. We were just talking about open doors. But the first one deals with ask. And it's, it, it, it continues to amaze me that so many times when my turn rolls around that what is happening on Wednesday night coincides with what we just dealt with on Sunday. This was already in my text before I went and prepared Wednesday night's Bible study, and there it was, Matthew 7, 7, ask, seek, and knock. In Matthew 7, Jesus is talking about asking, and that's the title of the Bible study, Asking in Prayer. Deals specifically, and he deals specifically with how an earthly father gives to his kids good things when they ask from him. And this is how he closes that stretch of verses. He said, if you then, being evil, talking about earthly fathers, if you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? I like that. Give good things to those who ask him. James qualifies the God that we are asking from by saying that he gives all, he gives to all liberally and without reproach. Without reproach means without blame, without rebuke, Without any kind of accusation. Well, you just came to me and asked for that because you just you just wanted something. 
There's no rebuke. There's no reproach. There's nothing in that. God gives to all men freely and fervently without reproach. The answer is it will be given to you. Now here's the question. I like this question. When did Jesus say your joy will be full? You may want to jot this verse down. John 16, 24. Jesus said, until now you have asked nothing in my name. There's the problem with prayer again. Until now you have asked nothing in my name. And then he says, ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. Do you remember what the title of this sermon is, My Joy? He said, ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. Here's where the issue of faith comes into play. And this is where the last two lets show up. You remember I said there were four lets in these seven verses? This is where the last two come in. James gives the exception. But let him ask in faith. I like that. He says, but let him ask in faith with no doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. Faith means to cancel out all doubt. That's what faith means. Because doubt is controlled by the winds, not by the Lord. Doubt is controlled by the storms that come in your life, not by the God of the storms. Faith is when you trust him, the one who controls the sea. And then the second let. James gives the reason. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. This is the bottom line. With faith, God gets in your boat. With doubt, you can't find him anywhere. I don't know about you. I choose A every time. I want to put my faith in him. I don't know if you remember when the disciples were on the storm tossed sea and that the, they, they saw somebody walking on the water. They supposed it was a ghost. And Peter said, Lord, if that's you, tell me to come to you. And he, he actually walked. He's the only one that got out of the, out of the boat, by the way. He stepped out of the boat, and for a few moments, he was walking on the water, and then he saw the storms and the winds and the waves and the clouds and everything that was happening around him. He saw all the stuff, and he doubted, and he started sinking. Immediately, Jesus was there, and they were back in the boat. You may be in a, in a boat in a storm-tossed sea right now. I encourage you, before you leave this place today, to say these words, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. That's where it leads you. He'll speak words to you that will cause your faith to rise up inside of you. And when it does, you grab hold of him because he'll get you where you need to go and he'll hold you through the whole process because he is faithful I'm going to ask you about your didn't get to the last point about wisdom ask Solomon when he was crowned king of Israel God came to him in a dream. And he said, one word, ask. What do you have me do for you? What do you want? But his, the one word he said was ask. Solomon said, I want understanding to be able to rule your people. I don't know if you know this, Solomon's considered to be the wisest man that ever lived. Wisdom came from God. God said through 
generous. If any man lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all men liberally and freely without reproach, and it will be You may need wisdom from where you are right now. The first step is to say, God, I need your help. I know I got wisdom. And whatever he shows you, whatever verse he takes you to in the Bible, you latch on to that for all. You are a good God. I'd be an idiot if I said that everything that happens in life is good. Not everything is good. But you are always good. The stuff in life doesn't change who you are. Help us to believe that who you are, even in the difficulties. God, I'll confess. I believe. There are times I need your help with my unbelief. For those who are facing difficulties right now, their, their boat is being rocked to and fro, and they don't know if they're going to make it through what they're in the middle of right now. God, I ask you to speak a word. Give them something to latch on to. Increase their faith. In and through the process, give them patience to believe that you are everything that your word says you are. You will not leave them. You will not forsake them. You will bring them through. God, thank you that you love us. God, give us joy that overwhelms us. sing. God's dead with your heart. I'm going to be down front. I'm going to ask a few of our deacons to move to the back. Uh, as we've been doing recently, we've got communion available in the back corner here by the cross. And so if you want to receive communion, you can meet a deacon back there. But as we stand and as we sing, if God is dealing with your heart, will you come?
Betty asked me to tell you that the friend, her friend that we've been praying for, Miss Shirley, uh, went back to the doctor this past week, and they've been doing, I think you said, 20 chemotherapies uh -huh. there. Yes, uh, they had done on her, and the doctor had asked them to come back, his family to come back, and he said, uh, we've done scans. There is no trace that you've ever had cancer. Amen. prayed that a lot, but so often we don't get that kind of word coming back from a doctor, but uh, I often pray. God, yeah. when the doctors get there, really? they find yeah. that you've already been there. That's the kind of God we serve. So thank you, Miss Betty, and uh, she wanted us to make sure he knows that you've been praying for. Uh, continue to pray for our church and pray for one another. God bless you. You are dismissed. Any word? Let's